you've done this before. <laughs> Uh, my name is John Wynn with Restoring Truth Ministries. I've been uh, blessed to work with Hugh Owen uh, for about the last nine years. And uh, this morning we're going to be speaking about the historical consequences of evolution theory. But let's begin with a prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we ask that you send the spirit of truth to be with us all of today as we begin to delve into the deceptive science that has been so effective in leading millions inside and outside the church into believing in the lie of evolution. We also ask that you be with us as we start to explain more fully the impact of Darwinism uh, inside the church and outside the church. Uh, so we just ask that this makes an impression on us and makes us realize the importance for standing for truth going forward. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. O Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for us sinners, now and at the hour of our death. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. If you can recall our opening talk on Monday morning when we had the two truth seekers, the young men up here, uh, uh, to ask some questions, and we went through a series of 12 pre presuppositions. The final presupposition was the question, why does it really matter? What's the relevance of studying evolution, evolutionary claims, and restoring the truth about origins in the church and in society? We will answer that question with four lectures, two today and two tomorrow. Today's lectures are really going to be focused on the impact of evolution theory within the Catholic Church. <clears throat> now, since evolution is part of a false philosophy that we'll discuss shortly here, uh, it's important that we begin this discussion in the area of philosophy and then show you how uh, evolution theory and false philosophy were able to come into the church and have destructive impact. You know, scientists always talk about this quest to find a unifying theme, one theory that explains all of reality in the natural world. <clears throat> and if, we, if we've talked about one underlying cause of all the problems that we see in the church today, I really think nothing does a, a better job of explaining the root, root cause of these problems than what we're going to talk about in the next two episodes. This first episode, or this first presentation, will be some historical background. We're going to start with the Greeks and work our way up uh, to the early 20th century, focusing primarily uh, on the area of natural science, how that was came to be viewed within the church after Darwinian theory. But then the second episode will be a discussion of how rationalism and Darwinian theory, what we call the Cartesian Darwinian narrative, how that drastically influenced theology, so not just on the question of origins, but all theology and philosophy. In fact, they went into a, a sort of death spiral after Descartes um, introduced his rationalism in the 1600s. This second presentation that we make will actually be our first public uh, showing of one of the episodes from our upcoming DVD series that Keith Jones has been uh, very diligent in working with us to develop, and we hope that these will be uh, out by the end of the year. But uh, we'll give an introduction to that during the second episode. I think, I think you'll find it very, uh, very informative and uh, entertaining at the same time. All right, so let's start then to lay the groundwork that we need for that second DVD or that second presentation that will be from our DVD series. And so this is uh, titled "Scoffers Will Arise: The Cartesian Darwinian Narrative." Cartesian is named after Rene Descartes, a philosopher that uh, lived in the 1600s, and then of course Charles Darwin, who published *The Origin of Species* in 1859. We could have called this presentation the long war against God. And of course, the Magisterium tells us that if anyone shall have said that the one true God, our Creator and our Lord, cannot be known with certitude by those things which have been made, 
by the natural light of human reason, let it be anathema. And yet even though we have natural knowledge of the, the existence of a creator, it really is through reason and philosophy, Western philosophy, that begin in ancient Greece that it is uh, that the war against God has been constantly launched. So in this session, we will explain how Christendom had defeated the atheistic philosophy of materialism by the Middle Ages, but due to the emergence of the Cartesian Darwinian narrative from 1637 through 1859, the materialist, rationalist philosophy now dominates the Western world. And when we talk about a narrative, what we're talking about here is, is really a meta-narrative. Philosophers use this term to describe a story that tries to explain history and phenomena by appealing to some kind of universal knowledge or schema. So let's go back now to ancient Greece and start to lay the groundwork for our discussion. Back in ancient Greece, there were many philosophers, I'm sure you studied uh, some of them in school. Uh, many of them could be divided either into theists or atheists. One of the largest schools was the School of Materialism. This was, uh, was supported and uh, founded by early philosophers such as Democritus. One of the most important philosophers for our discussion was a philosopher named Epicurus who died in 270 BC. He was a well-known great philosopher of materialism that basically holds nothing but matter exists. So there's nothing beyond the universe, only matter exists. And he believed, they believed in either an ancient or eternal universe in order to avoid the need for, uh, for admitting that there is a God. And so Epicurus and the other materialists believed that it was the random combination of atoms, matter, that accounted for everything. We have no need of a creator. Now Epicurus very quickly went from his scientific claim that there's nothing but matter and that matter is self-organizing into the conclusion that there really is no such thing as, as a moral absolute. He was a moral relativist and he said that the goal of life is to seek pleasure and to avoid pain. Today this view is often called hedonism. Seek pleasure and avoid pain sounds much like today's society, doesn't it? All right, um, the, the philosophy of materialism did not die with the ancient Greeks. We can document that it was transferred over into Roman culture. The most notable uh, materialist philosopher in Roman culture was Lucretius, who died uh, just shortly before Christ was born. And the addition to materialist theory that Lucretius really needs to be recognized as, as adding is that he de further developed the concept of how this matter might have produced all the living things that, that we can observe. And so in his poem on the nature of things, you'll read a description that very much sounds like Darwinian theory, uh, some 19 centuries before Charles Darwin actually published. So he wrote in On the Nature of Things, Many races of living things must have died out and been unable to beget and continue their breed. For in the case of all things which you see breathing, either craft or courage or else speed, has from the beginning of its existence protected and preserved each particular race. But those to whom nature has granted none of these qualities would lie exposed as a prey until nature brought that kind to utter destruction. So really, Charles Darwin added very little to this concept. Of course, we have the addition of, uh, of mutations as a claimed mechanism of evolution in the early 1900s that Pam will discredit shortly. But, um, but really, this concept of natural uh, organization of matter and then the survival of the fittest really goes uh, back to Lucretius, if not even further. And of course, the, the ultimate question is where did man come from? Lucretius also answered that in his, uh, in his writings. He wrote that the earth herself has gotten, a, has gotten and keeps the name of mother since she of herself gave birth to mankind. 
All right, well, with the emergence of Christianity, this led to a strong rejection of materialist philosophy by the church fathers. We read in scripture also that Paul engages the materialists or the Epicureans in Athens, and we read this account in Acts 17, 18. Many of the church fathers also wrote against materialism, including St. Jerome, St. Augustine, and Lactantius, who wrote the following. He said, I cannot pre be prevented from again showing the folly of Epicurus, for all the ravings of Lucretius belong to him. So these fathers knew exactly uh, who the materialist, influential materialists of the age were. For all the ravings of Lucretius belong to him who, in order that he might show that animals are not produced by any contrivance of the divine mind, but by chance, said that in the beginning of the world, innumerable other animals of wonderful form and magnitude were produced, but that they were unable to be permanent because either the power of taking food or the method of uniting and generating had failed them. It is evident that he wished to exclude the divine province through his writings. So here we, we don't even see a moment of considering seriously the claims that natural processes can account for everything. It was very clear to the fathers and to the, the magisterium in the early centuries that this was simply a philosophy put forward to deny the creator. Well, for the next 10 centuries, materialism was largely held at bay uh, because of Christianity. And in fact, the relationship of faith and reason held by the early churchmen wasn't formalized in a detailed philosophy, but still it was summarized by Beatrice, uh, saying that as far as you were able, join faith to reason. And St. Augustine's motto, understand in order to believe, believe in order to understand. Well, these, these thoughts of this philosophy further developed. We get to the philosophy of the Middle Ages, and really the, the peak of Catholic philosophy is called the period of high scholasticism, uh, which, which occurred in the 13th century. And of course, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas was the, the leading scholastic of his time and, and remains so. And really, Thomism was a remarkable achievement in, in many ways. One of the fundamental principles or beliefs of Thomism was the notion that truth cannot contradict truth. In other words, this means that truth in all domains, natural science, theology, and philosophy, was all in harmony and supported the Christian worldview. This actually gave rise to search for knowledge in all domains and led to advancements in all fields, including natural science, which is quite counter to what you also hear today. Theology, though, was recognized as the queen of the sciences, as some things could only be revealed by God. However, each area of study was recognized to properly have its own method of study. Well, this period of high scholasticism did not long, uh, last long following the death of uh, St. Thomas. Most historians of philosophy would mark the end of the high scholastic period with William Ockham, who died in 1347. And then we see a continued deterioration as we move toward the Renaissance in the 15th and 16th centuries. Part of this was due to a revival of the classic Greek scholarship, the Greek philosophers, due to new and better translations of their work. And so we start to see a downward spiral and confusion enter into the domain of philosophy during this period. So for example, this was facilitated uh, by the published uh, or by the reintroduction of the work of Lucretius in 1417 into Europe. And then in 1473, Lucretius's work was printed and became an ongoing source for Epicurean ideas in the West. In 1431, the third century work entitled Lives of the Eminent Philosophers was translated and provided the details of Epicurean philosophy. So combined with this confusion and this, this alternative view of things that comes through philosophy, then of course in the 1500s we have the uh, Protestant revolt that elevated man's reason above the authority of the magisterium and further opened the way for enlightenment philosophy. So what we have then by the year 1600 is broad skepticism. We have multiple different views of reality from the area of philosophy. Now we have division uh, in the West uh, between Catholics and, and Protestants. So when that broad skepticism emerged and philosophers begin to question, is there such a thing as, tr as truth? And one of the influential works of the age is, is or the age, 
uh, was from a French philosopher, Michael de Montaigne, who wrote in a work called An Apology for Raymond Savon. And he asked the question, is it within the capacity of man to find what he is looking for? Has that quest for truth, which has kept man busy for so many centuries, actually enriched him with uh, some new power or solid truth? And in, in this work, he compared the varying opinions among dozens of philosophers from the Greeks on concerning topics such as the existence of the soul, its composition, and location. And that at the end of the work, after he goes through presenting all these different opinions, he concludes. He says, there is a plague on man, his opinion that he knows something. Man is indeed out of his mind. He cannot even create a flesh worm, yet he creates gods by the dozen. And he talked about the term skepticism. He said, skepticism can best be conceived through the form of a question, what do I know? And summarizing the, the atmosphere in philosophical circles at the opening of the 17th century, Father Buckley writes that at the opening of the 17th century, there was a widespread conviction that the atheists were at the gates. But really, does that question from Montaigne, what do I know, that set the stage for Rene Descartes in the, in the 1600s? So we're going to talk a little bit now about Rene Descartes philosopher who lived from 1596 to 1650. The philosophy of Descartes was a desperate struggle to emerge from Montaigne's skepticism, so writes Etienne Gilson. Descartes credited his, credited his system to a series of three dreams given by what he called an angel of light, uh, writing in the Discourse on Method. But actually there's very good evidence that this philosophy came through demonic influence. And we'll, we'll go into some background of, of, of this uh, statement. Late in the year 1619, Descartes was a soldier wanting to be a philosopher uh, in, in the army. And he spent the winter in quarters near Ulm, which is part of modern day Germany. It is known through uh, various accounts, including his own uh, diary, that he was dabbling with the occult at this time by seeking out members of the Rosicrucian Society. Now, we no longer have Descartes' diary, his personal notes, but um, when, when Descartes was still alive, there was a biographer named Bellier who did have access to these notes, and he wrote a very detailed account of what happened during this, this series, uh, during this winter near uh, Ulm. So looking at Descartes' private notes, now lost, he wrote that Descartes felt stirring within, within him an emulation for the Rosicrucians that moved him all the more deeply because he was at the moment of his greatest perplexity concerning the means he should take in his search for the truth. Descartes actually, when you read his writings, it it's at least on the surface sounds like he had a sincere intent to restore truth and, and and combat the skepticism that was emerging. But if we look at his philosophy, it really was enormously destructive. And again, I, I'll explain why there's there's reason to believe this is demonically inspired. So this is during the winter of 1619, and Descartes had dreams, three dreams, on the evening of November 10th. An acquaintance that he simply referred to as the genius heightened in him the enthusiasm which had been, had been burning within, and this individual told Descartes that he would have dreams that night to guide him. And in fact, Descartes did have three dreams, and the so-called spirit of truth appeared and presented Descartes in the dream with this question. Which path shall I follow in life? Descartes believed that the spirit came to open for him what he called the treasure of all the sciences. Valier wrote that the spirit descended upon him and took possession of him. Descartes' path was really decided from that night on, and what emerged was what Descartes called his universal mathematics. His stated attempt was to eliminate skepticism, as I mentioned, resulting from the philosophical approaches that produced very results, and therefore only probabilities that the truth was known. Descartes had a very intense mathematical uh, background and training. Uh, he developed analytic ge geometry, 
And so his aim was to develop a new philosophy that approached the subject of philosophy in the same manner used to solve mathematic problems. This, the concept of this universal mathematics was to reject all such mere probable knowledge and to make it a rule to trust only what is completely known and incapable of being doubted. His system is commonly known as rationalism. Rationalism basically asserts that there cannot be anything that exceeds the power of human reason to comprehend. As we mentioned in our opening talk of the conference, so what happens if we really decide to reject anything that we can't fully understand? What happens to the belief in miracles, in prophecy, in the creation, in the incarnation, to the resurrection? All these must somehow be explained away rationally by the rationalists who cannot comprehend the power and providence of God. Rationalism resulted in the tragic, tragic separation of faith and reason. To Descartes, reason was supreme. He wrote, I have faith in the teachings of the church, but I simply bracket all that out. It is in the realm of religious sentiment and emotion, whereas my universal science is in the realm of reason and knowledge. So not only did he divide faith and reason, he is elevating reason above faith. He also wrote, I've always considered that the two questions respecting God and the soul were the chief of those who ought to be demonstrated by philosophical rather than theological argument. So not only is he now elevating philosophy above theology, he's going to use philosophy to come into the domain of, of theology and tell the theologians of the church really what is reasonable to, to believe and what is not reasonable to believe. Subsequent secular philosophers uh, strayed from the universal mathematics, but the separation of philosophy and theology remained, which is why Descartes is usually called the father of modern philosophy. So after Descartes, theologians had less and less to say in the discussion among Europe's intellectuals about the existence of God, the afterlife, and morality. By 1650, when Descartes died, rational, rationalism had already infected many universities and intellectuals in Europe. Now this whole brief summary of what happened uh, during this period is not new to the church, of course. In Faith and Reason, Pope St. John Paul II explained that as a result of the exaggerated rationalism of certain thinkers, there emerged eventually a philosophy which was separate from and absolutely independent of the contents of faith. What for patristic and medieval thought was both in theory and practice a profound unity was destroyed. All right, now there are many, many aspects to Descartes' philosophy that deserve uh, detailed discussion. But given the topic of this conference, we're going to focus on how his view, his rationalistic view, started to impact natural science uh, over a period of uh, decades and then really centuries. Now, one of the more important works of Descartes uh, that was not published during his lifetime due to his own decision was called The Mon or the World. <clears throat> it basically reduced God's role to one of flipping on the switch and walking away, very much a deist type uh, view of the world. And it's very interesting to read what is said in the world, and we start to understand why he chose not to publish. He wrote that the first from the first instant of their creation, small particles of matter continuing continue moving thereafter in accordance with the ordinary laws of nature. Even if we suppose that God creates nothing more than what I have said, and even if he does not impose any order, the laws of nature are sufficient to cause the parts of this chaos to disentangle. It's nothing more than Lucretius and, and Epicurus, right? Self-organizing matter. And arrange themselves in such a good order that they will have the form of a most perfect world. He got more specific. Nature alone is able to untangle the confusion of the chaos. And he made very specific, by nature here, I do not mean some deity or some sort of imaginary power. Rather, I use the word to signify matter itself. The rules by which these changes take place, I call the laws of nature. God will never perform a miracle in the new world. He wrote this in context of a, of a make-believe world in order to avoid uh, being excommunicated, a common trick of philosophers. Now concerning man, Descartes wrote in uh, Le Mans, 
He, he called him a machine made of earth. And while he did allow that God unites a rational soul to the machine, he also wrote the following. The soul can cause no movement in the body unless the corporal organs are, are required are properly disposed. And when the body has all the organs disposed for this movement, it does not need the soul to, to, to produce movement. It's like a vestigial organ all of a sudden. By 1633, Descartes had lar largely completed Le Mans, but before he could publish, as we learned uh, from Dr. Sengenis, the Galileo affair reached its climax and Descartes decided that he didn't want to risk being excommunicated. But unfortunately, his philosophy and his rationalism his venture into natural science did not end there. For he started work on uh, his, perhaps his most famous work, The Discourse on Method, which was published in 1637. And his hope was that it would be uh, less likely to trigger examination. Um, but in that, in that writing, he wrote the following that really marks the debut of the Cartesian part of the Cartesian Darwinian narrative. So this is what he wrote. He said that it is certain that the action by which God now preserves the world is just the same as that by which he first created it. By this means alone, all things which are purely material might in the course of time have become such as we observe them to be at the present. And their nature is much easier to understand when we see them coming to pass little by little in this manner than were we to consider them as all complete to begin with. So, what, what does he mean all complete to? He's talking about creation. So he's proposing an alternative method, a way to think about everything we see, the life, the universe, as coming about little by little over periods of time, rather than being created by God in the, during the six days of creation. Now, let's compare Descartes' statement here with the prophecy, you talked of this briefly yesterday, that is contained in 2 Peter 3, 3 through 6. <clears throat> so in 2 Peter, we read, In the last days there shall come scoffers with deceit, walking around according to their own lust, saying, Where is his promise or his coming? For since the Father slept, all things continue so from the beginning of creation. For this they are really willfully ignorant of, of that the heavens were before and the earth out of water and through water consisting by the word of God. So the earth and the universe did not come about through natural processes. It came about through the word of God during the six days of creation. So we see a, a very close parallel here to what is said in sacred scripture and what Descartes put, put forth in 1637. Uh, both of these describe the general, generally what is described as gradualism or uniformitarianism in science. Now what's interesting, as you continue to read through the discourse of method, Descartes first states that certain considerations prevented him from publishing the world. He's talking about this book, The World, in uh, Discourse of Method. So he's, he's saying, well, I couldn't do it because I couldn't publish because I didn't want to be excommunicated. But then he lays out the future path, the future agenda for other rationalists that would follow. And basically he, he instructed, he, he claimed that in certain areas of science, in the, the writing of the world, he set forth proofs of this gradual development. So let's look at uh, some examples of this. So basically, the uniformitarian program is laid out in the discourse on method. So for example, in cosmology, <coughs> explaining or what, he, what he claimed to have demonstrated in, in the world, he wrote that <coughs> he demonstrated the greatest part of the matter of which this chaos is constituted must, in accordance with these laws, dispose and arrange itself in such a fashion as to render it similar to our heavens. In the area of geology, he said, <clears throat> from this point it came to speak more particularly of the earth showing how the mountains, seas, fountains, and rivers could naturally be formed in it, and how the metals came to be. In the area of botany and biology, he said, in the plants to grow in the fields, and gen generally, <clears throat> And all bodies called mixed or composite might arise from a description of inanimate bodies and plants I passed on to that of animals. 
And he said, particularly to that of men. But since I have not yet sufficient knowledge to speak of them in the same style as the rest, notice he says, I had not yet found that, but he's, it's insinuated that the, the, the evidence is there. Since I have not yet sufficient knowledge to speak of them in the same style as the rest, that is to say, demonstrating the effects from the causes and showing them from what beginnings and what fashion nature must produce them, I contented myself with supposing that God formed the body of man altogether like one of ours. <clears throat> All right, so from this beginning, this introduction of the Cartesian narrative, Darwinian narrative, we see that in the year 1830, we have the first uh, very detailed description put forth of how uniform, uniformitarian principles may have actually formed what we see in the area of geology. This was put forth uh, by Charles Lyell in his Principles of Geology. And notice the parallel here as far as the background assumption Lyell, Lyell comes to uh, or presents his readers. He wrote that the value of all geological evidence must depend entirely on the degree of confidence which we feel in regard to the permanency of the laws of nature. Their immutable constancy alone can enable us to reason. The uniformity of the, you know, uniformity of the plan being once assumed, events which could have occurred in the most distant periods will be acknowledged and the deficiency of our information respecting some of the most obscure parts of the present creation will be removed. And of course, in the area of uh, biology, Charles Darwin, uh, who lost his faith in large part by reading Lyell when he was on his voyage of, um, on the, uh, the Beagle, explains in The Origin of Species that the whole history of the world, although of a length quite incomprehensible by us, is a mere fragment of time compared with the ages which have elapsed since the first creature. It's also note, important to notice that Darwinism itself involves the application of uniformitarian principles to biology as it extrapolate, extrapolates presumed evolutionary processes back <clears throat> to the beginning of life in some warm little pond. So in this manner, the special creation of man and the animal kinds are attacked without directly challenging sacred scripture. He wrote that we may feel certain that the ordinary succession by generation has never once been broken and that no cataclysm has desolated the whole world. So again, so again denying the, uh, the reality of teaching of scripture and as well as the flood. So we have, we see impacts in geology, in biology, and of course the Big Bang model, which we'll have a presentation on uh, this afternoon, also tries to extrapolate purely natural processes to explain the beginning of the cosmos, the very claim going all the way back to Epicurus that the universe is self-organizing. Now it's very interesting, when you talk with most Catholics, even, even with uh, Catholic teachers at the college level, very, very few know about the Cartesian Darwinian narrative. Uh, my daughter went to one of the more conservative Catholic colleges, got a degree in philosophy and theology, and I asked her, did you ever study Descartes? Oh yeah, we studied Descartes. And I asked her about this, this thread of thought that came out of his writings, no discussion at all. That's really tragic because actually secular philosophers for more than a century have capitalized on this relationship and uh, celebrated the Cartesian Darwinian narrative. For example, philosopher John Dewey, who uh, we'll talk about extensively in one of the lectures tomorrow, he wrote the following in 1909 in a work called The Influence of Darwin on Philosophy and Other Essays. He said that when Descartes said the nature of physical things is much more easily conceived when they are beheld coming gradually into existence, the modern world became self-conscious of the logic, which is uniform terrorism, that was henceforth to control it. The logic of which Darwin's origin of species is the latest scientific achievement. Well, why is this statement, particularly by John Dewey, so important? Because he was a leading humanist at the turn of the 20th century and is still called the father of American education. He brought the narrative into public school classrooms so whole generations could be converted to atheism. Again, we'll talk about this for an entire period uh, tomorrow. 
So this, when you look at this, this, uh, the statement that Dewey intended to convert whole generations, it's a very ambitious statement, no, no doubt, uh, to think that a, a nation that had such a strong Christian foundation could be led astray. But let's ask ourselves, if this was in fact his intent, what could stop a like-minded educational establishment from achieving that aim? Would it be the scientists that that would be there to refute Darwinism? The answer is no. Going back to polls as early as 1914 in the United States, uh, these polls show that leading scientists were already converted to Darwinism and the, the narrative just as they are today. In the National Academy of Sciences for, uh, today, for example, 95% of the biology arm of the NAS uh, consists of avowed atheists. Well, what about the church itself, the Catholic Church? Well, we will see tomorrow that in two encyclicals, one in the 1920s, one in the 30s, the church did object specifically to the approach of education being adopted in the United States, but it really had very little impact. In part, this was because the Catholic scholars were already themselves Darwinists and many were rationalists, and so the protests against U.S. education denounced the fruit, which was the humanistic indoctrination, but not they did not address the root, which the, was the narrative itself. This was a tragic mistake that departed from the instructions already given by the magisterium uh, telling us how to address the false claims in natural science. Well, what, was, what were these instructions? It comes from the 1983 encyclical Protestantismus Deus, where Pope Leo XIII set forth the following instructions just as rationalistic science was coming in to attack uh, claims uh, of reliability in scripture and, and multiple church doctrines. He addressed both the clergy and scientists in this encyclical. First related uh, to biblical scholars, he said we have to contend against, not forfeit the domain, we have to contend against those who make an evil use of physical science, minutely criticize, criticize the sacred books in order to detect the writers in a mistake. The nature of science, just as it's so admirably it is so admirably adopted to show forth the glory of the great creator, provided it be taught as it should be. So if it be per perversely imparted to the youthful intelligence, it may prove most fatal in destroying the principles of true philosophy and in the corruption of morality. Hence to the professor of sacred scripture, a knowledge of natural science will be of great, very great assistance in detecting such attacks and in refuting them. So he didn't just say, oh well, we'll just go over to the narrative, we can turn over the six days of creation and go to this Darwinian explanation without any problem at all. No, he said we need to learn the science, we need to engage in this battle. It wasn't done. Secondly, to the uh, Catholic scientists, he wrote, to undertake fully and perfectly and with all the weapons of the best science, it is an enterprise which we have a right to expect the cooperation of all those Catholics who have acquired reputation in any branch of learning or whatever. The bitter tongues of objectors will be silenced, or at least they will not dare to insist so shamelessly that faith is the enemy of science when they see that scientific men of eminence in their profession show towards the faith most marked honor and respect. But unfortunately, these instructions were not followed, and the topic of origins was forfeited to natural to natural science. Well, what's an example of, of this this forfeit that went on and, and this departing from the instructions of Providentissimus Deus? One very influential book of the period was written by Father John O'Brien. It, it is entitled uh, Evolution of Religion. It was written in 1932. He opens the book by making the following statement. The author does not believe that it is the function of the philosopher nor of the theologian to quarrel with the scientist concerning either the truthfulness or the accuracy of the data reported. So remember Dr. Sagittis was talking about, well, we can all study the data, but then there comes this question of interpretation. Well, Father O'Brien, he doesn't even want to worry about studying the data. He's just going to forfeit all the claims to natural science. He said that is a matter for the scientists to determine among themselves. The true function of the philosopher is to interpret the larger meaning of data reported by the scientists. Accepting the conclusions of the scientists, 
the other undertakes to interpret philosophical implications of evolution and to trace their bearing upon the theistic interpretation of the universe. So he's already been won over by the evolutionary claims. He's going to say, well, it's not my job to argue against Darwin. I'm just going to say, assuming Darwinism is true, what does that do to the faith? It destroys it. So here we see that the study of origins was forwarded to natural science. There were, though, some theologians and scholars at the time that, that sounded the alarm, tried to make a difference, and warned where this type of approach would lead. In fact, in 1925, a young father, Fulton J. Sheen, warned in his book, God and the Intelligence in Modern Philosophy, about the impact of Darwinism in the Catholic Church. He wrote that surely, slowly but surely, the idea of evolution is undermining the foundation of Orthodox Christian theology. As the idea of evolution makes headway, the foundations of the Orthodox theology, which have long shown signs of instability, will become more and more unstable, and at last, in the fullness of time, the whole structure will totter and fall. Nevertheless, because no direct challenge to the supposed scientific evidence behind Darwinism was set forth, the narrative took over the thinking of most Catholic scholars after the turn of the 20th century. One tragic example is uh, a, a priest you may have heard of named Father Tehar de Chardin. We want to talk a little bit about him because more than anybody else, it was Deschardin that brought this evolutionary thinking into Catholic theological circles. So Taylor Deschardin lived from 1881 to 1955. He was a Frenchman ordained into the priesthood in 1911. Interestingly, he was also a paleontologist who participated in the Piltdown Man frauds uh, that occurred in Europe from 1908 through 1912. And then he was also involved in the Peking Man excavations in China. He was tragically influenced by the writings of a philosopher, uh, Henry Bergson, who wrote a book called Creative Evolution in 1907. Bergson was basically what we call an evolutionary pantheist. All that exists is matter, but matter is basically <coughs> deified. So here's some quotes from, de de from uh, Tehar de Chardin in his writings. He wrote that the biological process now taking place in mankind consists in the pro progressive development of a collective human consciousness. He wrote, I can be saved only by becoming one with the universe. Thereby, too, my deepest pantheist aspirations are satisfied. He wrote, man's origin by way of evolution is now an indubitable fact for science. There can be no two ways about it. To continue to debate it, to debate it in the schools is a waste of time. So far removed from the instructions of Pope Leo the Thirteenth. He wrote that a religion of evolution, that when all is said and done, is what man needs ever more explicitly if he is to survive and super live. The comparative value of religious creeds may be measured by the respective power of evolutive activation. Deschardin's real goal was to usher in a general convergence of all religions in which evolution would be the central doctrine. We're almost there, aren't we? Listen to these words. Is evolution a theory, a system, or a hypothesis? It is much more. It is a general condition to which all theories, all hypotheses, all systems must bow. All Does that include theology? All systems? Yeah in which they must satisfy henceforth, henceforth if they were to be thinkable and true. Evolution is a light illuminating all facts, a curve that all lies must follow. Well, even though his works were banned from Catholic institutions uh, after, after they were written, they nevertheless had enormous influence. Tehard was the reason that Humani Generis was issued in 1950, but nearly all scholars and scientists ignored the call to look at the evidence because they were already Darwinists. Today, polls show that Deschardin is actually the most influential person on the New Age movement, and he is honored by humanists as well. The general convergence of religion is well advanced. Well, it's very interesting to ask, as with Descartes, what was the basis? What was it simply his reasoning through the reading of Bergson and others that brought him to this type of evolutionary pantheism? 
were really given very uh, clear insight into this question in Deschardins' final major work, which is called The Heart of Matter. And he explains that from a young age, he was fascinated with matter and sought a continued and increased contact with the cosmic in the solid state. Like Descartes, when Deschardins was at a standstill in his awakening to cosmic life, those are his words, he wrote that he needed the intervention of a new force or a new illumination. For if the initial call that I had heard was in fact coming from matter, then someone kept whispering within me, why should I not look for the essence of matter for its heart? Do you see how dangerous he went into uh, following this, this, this line of thinking? Soon he obtained a presence, a consciousness of a deep running ontological total current which embraced the whole universe. This consciousness filled with the whole horizon of my inner being and that the fire had been kindled through the cult of matter, the cult of life, and the cult of energy. This is explained further in uh, the heart of matter because he's thinking back to and trying to express to the reader the feeling that came over him when he first was influenced by, by these feelings. And he explained in the heart of the matter that a piece he wrote back in 1919, when a very young, he was a very young priest, called The Spiritual Power of Matter, uh, was still the best expression of what happened to him as he experienced this contact with what he calls this, uh, the spirit of matter. Um, and so let me read from this, the excerpt from uh, the, the Spiritual Power of Matter. He wrote that the man was walking in the desert when the thing swooped down on him. Then suddenly a breath of scorching hot air passed across his forehead, broke through the barrier of his closed eyelids, and penetrated his soul. The man felt he was ceasing to be merely himself. An irresistible rapture took possession of him as though all the sap of living things was mightily refashioning the enfeebled fibers of his being. And at the same time, the anguish of some superhuman peril oppressed him, a confused feeling that the force which, he had, which had swept down upon him was equivocal, turbid, the combined presence of all evil and all goodness. The thing, which is the, 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 the soul of matter that he encountered, then speaks in this account. The thing says, you called me, here I am, grown weary of abstractions, of attenuations, of the wordiness of social life. You wanted to put yourself against reality, entire and untamed. I was waiting for you in order to become holy, and now I am established on you for life or for death. He who has once seen me can never forget me. He must either damn himself with me or save me with himself. So we, here we see how absolutely tragic, one of the tragic directions that evolutionary thought and Cartesian rationalism can take a person. And it's just uh, mind boggling, boggling to think how much influence Deschardin has had both in the church, outside the church, and yet there isn't a scrap of evidence on which to base evolutionary thinking. Well, let's just give a summary. We've covered a lot of centuries here. Let's just give a brief recap, and then we'll, we'll talk about our second episode coming up. So we discussed that rational, rationalism is really a, a false philosophy a linked to Rene Descartes, and evolutionism, which is from Charles Darwin, are really historically and logically inter, intertwined. We cannot understand the rapid, rapid spread of Darwinism without understanding that it is, it is a necessary outgrowth of rationalism, which had been poisoning the minds of Europe since, since 1637, when Descartes published his Discourse on Method. Rationalism asserts that there cannot be anything which exceeds the power of human reason to comprehend. He also called for uniformitarianism to be applied to natural science, and he rejected the creation providence framework. Uniformitarianism was applied to geology by Lyell, the principles of geology in 1830, and to biology by Charles Darwin in 1859. So Darwinism and Big Bang cosmology were the final piece of rationalistic philosophy as it expanded into natural science. 
Many Catholic scholars and lay scientists were converts by the early 1900s, which is why humani generis is generally ignored or misrepresented when the subject of evolution comes up. Now, let's talk about one question here. So we've talked about the discretion, discretion of rationalism. Is there more to this story? And the answer is yes, and that's what we'll go into in the next episode. So already we've talked about rationalism with Descartes, it's transferred to theology, <coughs> Darwinism, and how obviously this created doubt about Genesis and the doctrine of creation. But the question emerges, and that is, if Descartes published Discourse on Method in 1637, and it wasn't until 1830 that Lyell came out with principles of geology. The question is, was the enemy of truth patiently sitting around for almost 200 years until Lyell and Darwin published? And again, the tragic answer is no, because rationalism by the early 1800s had already deeply penetrated into theology and philosophy for nearly 200 years, as our next presentation will show. So this means that when Darwinism and, or Darwin and Lyell, uh, while they did not begin the rationalistic assault on truth, they actually completed it. And they were held by rationalistic biblical scholars and philosophers for opening up a third front in the war against truth. So we can present this instead of a timeline, we can present it a little bit differently showing that we, we've talked about how rationalism went into the area of natural science, emerged again with Lyell, Darwinism, and the Big Bang cosmology. We've discussed a little bit how Darwinism separated faith and reason, and how we had a uh, trickling of evolution theory into Catholic uh, theological uh, circles through Deschardins. But we're going to uh, talk about much more in the area of theology and philosophy, and how this line of thought continues until this day, and is extremely destructive, and really, I believe, accounts for almost all the errors that we're hearing and problems we're seeing in the church today. All right, let's close with a prayer, please. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and Holy Spirit. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to get together and to discuss what has gone wrong as we uh, transition now into our, our second uh, presentation shortly. We ask that you send the spirit of truth and let us understand what is at the source of all the error that we're seeing inside and outside the church today. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. Okay.